All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, we are have a lovely speaker here with us today. We are going to be talking about accounting. Yay! <laughs> Taxes, all those things. Money. So, Alicia, will you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? And Absolutely. Um, so, my name is Alicia Sisk Morris. Uh, I am a certified um, public accountant CPA uh, with an office located in the North Asheville Woodfin area. Uh, I've had my license since uh, 1999 and I've uh, been working with businesses, so oh gosh, since uh, the early 90s. So um, I'm here to support and help. Um, my office is fully staffed. I guess I've got about seven, eight people here, including myself, uh, and we're fully prepared to do all types of accounting work bookkeeping, payroll, and tax preparation, along with business consulting. Of course, we're getting ready to gear up for tax season. Uh, so a lot of the comments I'll make today will help you prepare yourself uh, when it comes time to do your 2022 tax returns, um, and as well as structuring yourself so that you're um, set up for success for 2023. Um, my background includes a, a business degree from Carolina, North Carolina, in Chapel Hill, I also have a master's degree in entrepreneurship from Western. And like I said, I've been a licensed CPA since 99. So um, most of my clients are self-employed. So I, my world is your world. Yeah. So obviously as 1099 employees, it's a, uh, it's a whole thing to kind of work it's through. It's a different world. And if any of you have never been in the 1099 world, um, it's, it's very different from, from receiving a salary and, and, filing w uh, receiving w-2s and filing those on your tax return um, as a 1099 person you're responsible for all your taxes through the estimated taxes process uh, unless you're set yourself up for, as an s corp and are already running payroll on yourself but most of the agents um, that i'm aware of particularly when we start working with them um, they're just running their business on their social security number uh, and they just do a schedule c on the personal tax return and then we assess, you know, and we'll discuss this a bit in further later about the values of LLCs and S corps and what all that means. Um, but I'll kind of take you soup to nuts through that whole process. Great. Um, so we talked about a couple of different topics. If you want to go ahead and start, okay, sure. brand new agent coming right. in. How so, do I get myself up for success? Sure. So the first thing that you need to do is realize that your business and your personal finances need to be separate. And, and I do mean separate. So I want you to have a separate credit card that you use exclusively for business, a separate credit card you use exclusively for your personal things. I want you to have at bare minimum two bank accounts. I want your personal checking or savings account where you buy groceries, you pay for your kids' soccer, you pay your personal mortgage, all your personal expenses need to go through that account and all your business expenses need to either go on the business credit card and go through your business bank account. All of your income. So when you have a closing, all the income needs to go into that business bank account. Now, um, depending on where you bank, most banks have small business bank accounts. So you can go to, so I'm in Weaverville. So we got PNC, we've got Wells Fargo, um, we've got local home trust, telco. You can walk in there and you can have your personal account, but you can also set up your business bank account. Now, once the money lands in your business bank account for any time you receive commissions, it's your money. Transfer whatever you need over to your personal bank account and pay those personal expenses um, out of it. It is extremely important to keep those separate. Um, the first reason is that as a self-employed person, you're higher at risk of being audited. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And if the IRS is going to come knocking on your door, you want to only give them the information that pertains to your tax return. And if we keep everything separate on your business bank account and your business credit card, then it's easier to get the IRS what they need without giving them any more than necessary. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is that it is infinitely easier 
to do accounting for your business, whether we do it or you do it, if all those expenses are separate. So instead of looking at an Excel spreadsheet or a QuickBooks account, and you're having to sort out, well, this is Ingalls is groceries, but this Ingalls was for an open house for some donuts. And this postage was me mailing my niece a gift. And this postage was me mailing out Christmas cards. It's hard to remember it, but if you have your account separate, and you're swiping a debit or credit card for your business account, for your business expenses, well, then you know everything on those bank statements are going to be deductible for you, and everything that's personal is going to be on a different account. So that's like the my number one thing. Um, whether you choose to be an LLC or not, that's up to you. Um, as a self-employed person, it's... Um, I, I want you to make sure your paperwork is tight, but again, because again, you're higher likely to be audited. So let's talk about some of the things that are deductible for you and are not deductible for you. So does everybody work from home? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming Sarah can't hear anybody. Yes. Um, so there's one deduction called the home office deduction. Um, usually what I need for your tax return for that is the square footage of your house, total house, and the square footage of the room that you use exclusively for business. That means it's not a room that has exercise equipment and your kids, you know, entertainment center for video games and your office is in the corner. I mean, like an exclusively used space. If you have that, um, that's a pretty nice deduction. So like I said, you just need to measure the room and know what the square footage of your house is. And those are the numbers we need for that deduction. Um, the other huge one for um, real estate agents is mileage. Now, the IRS wants a mileage log. What does that look like? So that's going to be a pad of paper that you keep in your car, or you can download an app to track it. The mileage needs to be the date, where you went, the reason you went, starting and ending um, mileage. Now, Old school way of doing it, like my dad used to do it, is he had a clipboard kept in his car. You could keep a spiral pound notebook. It doesn't matter. And every time you get in the car, you write all this information down. Um, the modern way to do it, and I'm hoping I can show this app on my phone to you. Um, it's called, this particular program that I personally use is called Mile IQ. It is available on... Apple and on Android phones. So it's called Mile. Uh, let's see if you can see it. Mile IQ. And what happens is each time you get in your car, it's going to, hopefully you can see that, it's going to create this handy dandy little map. And it's going to be the little green dot is where I began. The red dot is where I ended. It's going to tell you how many miles I drove and actually it's going to track the dollar amount value for me on my tax return on that. So at the end of each day, all I have to do is swipe to the right if it's business and swipe left if it's personal. And it's gonna create the prettiest little tax uh, spreadsheet you've ever seen. So at the end of the year, you can download that spreadsheet and print it and put it in your tax documents with someone like me to fill out or some if you're doing it yourself. So you'll be able to track which miles were business and which miles were personal. That's another key one. Um, another big question is, um, yes, you need to track all your fees because I know you're paying for MLS, you're paying association dues, you're paying transaction processing fees um, to EXP. There's all kinds of fees that you're paying. So those are all deductible. Um, advertising, if you buy leads or you run advertising or you have a website, um, all those fees are deductible. Uh, if you, I know like um, Zillow and I can't think of all the other ones, Realtor.com, a lot of those websites you can buy or share commissions with to get leads. So those are deductible, so track those. Um, meals and entertainment, that's a big one um, that people ask a lot about. So entertainment is not deductible at all anymore. It used to be, but it went away in 2018. So if you take a client out to a ball game, the tickets for the ball game is not deductible. 
the hot dog and, and chips and fries and nachos that you buy is deductible. So make sure you keep those separate. If you are um, wanting to write off meals, make sure you write on your receipt who you met with or do what I do, which is I log those sorts of meetings in my QuickBook, I mean, excuse me, my um, Google Calendar. So I know what client I was meeting with when I was meeting, so it's easy for me to reproduce. And then you'll need to be able to tell the IRS, well, yes, I met with, you know, Kimmy on this date and we went to Bellagio's and here's my receipt. Uh, the IRS will want that kind of level of detail. Driving through a drive through between appointments is not a deductible meal. What makes it a deductible meal is you actually have to be eating with someone discussing business. So if, you know, Kimmy and I are sitting having a meal together, then that counts. If I'm driving through Chick-fil-A in between appointments, that doesn't count. If you go to a conference, it's out of town. I know some of the uh, real estate groups will have like annual conferences in Vegas or something. Um, your flights, your hotel, and all of your meals are deductible, even if you eat them by yourself because you've traveled away from home and you can prove that through your Airbnb receipt or hotel receipt. And then those travel meals and meals while you're out of town are deductible. Um, let's see, what are some of the other biggies? Uh, if you have to buy signs and signage, if you um, have office supplies, laptop computers, tablets, um, let's see what else, your, your fees that you pay for, um, to North Carolina for your uh, business privilege license, those are deductible. Um, trying to think of what else. Those are the big ones that I see the most. Now, I will, I do want to say um, and discuss with you a little bit about cars because this is a number one question I probably get asked more than anything. So a lot of people want to go buy or lease or um, make payments on time to a, for a vehicle to use in business. So for me or any accountant to deduct it on your return, the, the vehicle first and foremost needs to be in the name of the business. So if you have not formed a corporation or an S corp, it's fine for it to be in your name. Now, if you write off and depreciate that vehicle, you're going to depreciate the cost of it. You're going to write off the interest related to it, miles, tires, oil changes, everything you're going to write off. But you're going to have to split the mileage out between personal and business and you're going to need to, what most people do is you can reimburse the company for personal use of business miles. Now, the easy way around all this to not have to track all of that is just take the standard mileage rate. Uh, and nine times out of 10, that's going to be more money for you uh, unless you are driving a really big, expensive vehicle to, to uh, operate. And that vehicle is over 6,000 um, pounds of, of gross weight, empty weight. So I would say probably 90% of the people just write off the mileage. And then we don't have to worry about adding back the personal use of a company and vehicle. What's now, the you have, deduction rate right now? Uh, it just increased. Hold on one second. I'll tell you. Love an increase. Yes. Yes, it absolutely did. So 23, the mileage rate is now... It went up three cents over 2022, and it's now 65 and a half cents. Okay. So from an accounting standpoint, it's easier on you. And honestly, I've got a Honda Accord that I bought in 1990, brand new. It's got mm, almost 400,000 miles on it. I assure you, I fully depreciated that car. Um, we just use it as a backup beater kind of car. Um, and... I can still ride that car off at 65 and a half cents a mile if I drive it for business. Um, if it, if I'd only depreciated and took it, its expenses, you know, it, there would be virtually no write-offs at this point. So just to give you a, a point of comparison. Now, if your business, like you say, your, your spouse is also in construction, those are different vehicles. You know, we're talking F-350s that are going to run, gosh, 50 to $100,000. Those are not your grocery go-getter cars. Um, they're going to have a lot of tools. They're going to get beat up a lot. Those are vehicles I tend to depreciate. 
Um, but for personal vehicles, like just your standard cars, it, it tends to, when I compare the two, um, it, you tend to come out ahead taking the mileage. Uh, and like I said, there's the app you can use or there's the um, you know, pen and paper method, either is fine. So what you do during the year is you've got a couple of options. You can create a spreadsheet and track all your income and expenses by month, and you can use that, total it up. And at the end of the year, you can say, here's my totals for all these expenses. Or you can purchase and use a program like QuickBooks Online, where you can link your business credit card and your business bank account to it. And that will pull in all the transactions into it and you can code them by what type of expense it is. Um, we, you will need to do what's called bank reconciliations, which is the formal accounting process of comparing your um, what's in QuickBooks to what's on the bank statement to make sure that you have everything in there. Um, I do know that sometimes that handshake between the bank and QuickBooks Online falters. And that means sometimes expenses are missed and sometimes expenses are doubled up. So it's super important you do the bank reconciliations before we print a profit and loss statement that we use for um, the tax return. So um, definitely, like I said, there's this is one of the benefits of keeping everything separate. Um, let's see, what, what, what questions do people have about any expenses before I move on to LLC versus S-Corp? Alicia, I have a question. Sure. Uh Oh, I have been using QuickBooks um, since I started in mm -hmm. real estate. I I didn't um, separate, like I'm using it for all expenses, but I'm mm -hmm. categorizing, you know, personal and business. So when it comes time to prepare everything for taxes, if I'm going to use an accountant, would I just exclude all the personal um, categories and just just send the business. So the, the inside QuickBooks exclude means it doesn't go into your bank register, which means it will mess up your bank reconciliation. So it's impossible to do it. So your only option is to go back in and for the entire year, all of the expenses that are personal, then you're going to have to match them as owner's distributions. So it gets it off of the profit and loss statement. Well, is that if <laughs> I... I I don't have a formal LLC. Like I didn't. Yeah, I didn't yeah. It's the LLC. only. It's literally the only way in QuickBooks to get your profit and loss down to just the expenses that are deductible. Because I, I would imagine if you print your P and L right now, you're going to have things like groceries and gasoline, and you know, going to the movies or your more personal mortgage or whatever. So it all needs to be moved off the income statement or the profit and loss statement and moved to the balance sheet. And the balance sheet account you would use is owner's draw. That's that's how you extract it. It's still in the check register, so you can reconcile the bank account, but you got to move it all over there so that your profit and loss is is ex it just the, um, the business expenses. And then, you know, it's January the 8th. So what I would do is run out. Who do you bank with? Uh, Wells Fargo. Okay. So Wells Fargo has a bunch of different business accounts. I would run to Wells Fargo to make your life easier. I'd immediately open a business bank account. I would route all of your deposits um, from your commissions, have them deposited in that account instead of your current account. Mm -hmm. And I, and that way you're not having to expend so much energy. Yeah, that's my plan for 2023 it. is to make yeah. it a lot easier. Yeah, and you'll want to stop pulling in those business bank. You want to close out that business bank account on QuickBooks, excuse me, the, the personal bank account on QuickBooks. You want to close down your personal credit card and you want to make sure that the only thing that gets linked and pulled in is your business. So now is a good time to clean it up yep. for last year so you can have a good P&L, but also for going forward, you'll, you'll need to link and create new bank accounts so your business will be clean. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just as a quick, Kristen, you might need uh, an EIN. I have one. Oh, you do have one. Yep. Yep. So I went through the whole process to establish the LLC and I'm going to do the S Corp election. I just haven't done it yet. And then I'm going to open the business account. So yeah, 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 everything's yeah. like, I'm, <laughs> I'm moving through all my checklist items. <laughs> 
So let's talk about LLC, the purpose of it, and the, the choice to go S-Corp elections and the extra requirements as pertain to it, because that is an, another number one uh, commonly asked question. So LLC stands for Limited Liable Corporation. Think of it as it's not you. It's like a baby you've given birth to, a little business baby. And that means it's going to have its own legal entity and name that you have um, uh, registered with the state of North Carolina. Um, you're also going to need to have an EIN number specific, not an EIN number based on you, an EIN number based on the business. So let's say we call it ABC Real Estate. So I go to the Secretary of State. I've registered everything. I've got all the paperwork done. I connect with the um, IRS. I make sure we have an EIN number that's set up for that. And I make sure that we set it up for the type of LLC it is. Uh, and then you'll use those two pieces of paper, the LLC paperwork and the EIN letter from the IRS will go to your bank and you set up a bank account because you're doing yourself no, no help if you have an LLC, but you're not running everything through the LLC book. The reason that is, is it's called you've pierced the corporate veil. If you are not behaving in a business-like fashion, you're losing the value of the LLC because then any attorney can say, well, she has an LLC, but she's not using it. So we can still sue her personally. So if something goes wrong with a real estate transaction, if you're doing it as an individual, you're going to first, they're going to first lean on your errors and emissions insurance or whatever. But then if that does not satisfy that lawsuit, all your personal income and assets could be subject to being pulled into that lawsuit. So if you own a house, you got a 401k plan, you got a spouse, you got a kid's college fund, all your personal stuff can be drug in. So that's why it's very common in a high um, auditable and high risk business, um, which real estate is, is to form the LLC to separate you personally and um your business transactions for your personal transactions. So once you've set up that entity and set up that bank account, like I said earlier, make sure all the income goes in, you transfer money out to pay yourself, and you um, pull out all of your expenses through that bank account. And if you use credit cards, pay everything on the credit card, clear it out through and pay, make the payment on that credit card through your business bank account. So everything keeps super clean, separate, um, for your protection, to protect you from audits, uh, as well as to protect and, and, and make sure your assets are protected. Now, an LLC can be lots of different things. So it's a limited liability corporation. Well, you can be an LLC of just you. And in that case, you're still a sole proprietor with the protection of a limited liability corporation. And you just do a regular tax return with Schedule C. If you and a buddy decide to form an LLC together, by default, you are now a partnership that is requiring you to do a partnership tax return. It's at Form 1065. And if your income is high enough that it justifies you becoming an S-Corp, that's additional paperwork you elect and file with the IRS. It's something we do for our clients. Um, then you'll be filing a, a 10 S, which is a um, S-Corporation tax return. Now, you need to be making enough money that it makes sense to be an S-Corp. S-Corps are very valuable uh, tax-saving tools, but if you're only pulling in $20,000, dollars $50,000, it's not worth it to do it. Um, I like to see profit-wise uh, someone to be north of $60,000 before they consider being an S-Corp. Because once you become one, you're one, and you can't change it from year to year. You can, un you can elect to stop being an escort, but once you do that, you're, you're done for five years. So it's, it's not a lightly made decision. Then the number one thing that people forget to do when they form their S corporation is it is a tenant of that requirement. This is literally on the IRS website. It says thou shalt run payroll. So, I mean, and that's real payroll, not pretend payroll, not transferring money from your business to your personal. I'm talking W-2 payroll with quarterly 941s being filed and paid. I'm like talking a payroll service. Um, so you'll need to run real full-on payroll. We do that. Um, but there is some tax savings um, for you from doing the S-Corp. So all your income and expenses will be on a separate tax return now. Um, the S Corp does not require double taxation like a C corporation does, which is good. 
So you're going to get taxed for federal and state, Social Security and Medi uh, Medicare for your W-2 wages. So I'll make up some numbers. Uh, where's my calculator? So say you make $100,000 profit and we're going to run payroll of $50,000. So you're going to have a W-2 that says $50,000. You're going to withhold Social Security, Medicare, uh, federal and state taxes are going to be sent on your behalf. That other $50,000 worth of profit is going to show up on your personal tax return through a form called a K-1. It's generated from the tax return. It lands on your personal Schedule E. And that is going to be taxed for just federal and state taxes. You do not pay Social Security and Medicare on S corporate distributions or S the profit after the um, your wages and expenses. So in the scenario I just shared with you, you just saved seven thousand six hundred fifty dollars in federal taxes and another. Let's see. $2,625 in North Carolina taxes. So you know, you're saving almost 10 grand in taxes. It's worth doing. Now, it's going to cost you more, but you're going to come out ahead. And that's why I want someone making at least $60,000 because you're going to pay, I'll use me as an example. You're going to pay me to file two tax returns now, a personal one and a business one. And you're also going to be paying someone like me to run your payroll. So we're going to run your payroll. We're going to pay your taxes quarterly. We're going to print your W-2s at the end of the year. Um, we're going to be doing all the things necessary to keep you in compliance with payroll. And it's important to make sure that your payroll is what's called fair and customary. The IRS is going to not be happy with you if you have an S-Corp that makes $100,000 and you run payroll of 10. You're not the first person to figure out there's tax savings in doing that. So they're going to audit you. And if you if they audit you, they're going to make your S Corp as if it wasn't there. And they're going to tax you for the full hundred thousand dollar profit. And it's like it wasn't even there. So that's that's what can happen. I actually had a client that came to me that was um had done the S Corp election with her prior accountants and they did not run payroll. So by the time she found me and we got her straight she ended up having to pay back taxes for every single year she didn't run payroll. So if she made, say she made $40,000, well, they're gonna disregard her S-Corp election and treat that $40,000 as 100% payroll and make her pay all those back taxes plus interest plus penalties. This is a massively expensive mistake. So if you are making enough that you wanna be an S-Corp, I'm 100% for it. We just need to make sure we cross every T and dot every I so that A, your salary is, 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 a, is fair and reasonable, and B, it doesn't show up as a, a red flag or a mistake on your tax return that the IRS is going to seek you out because they're not going to seek you out right now for last year's tax returns. They're auditing tax returns from three years ago. So we want to try to make sure everything's clean, everything's organized, everything's in either a spreadsheet or in QuickBooks and in a format that if you do get audited, we can drag up all your stuff from three years ago and answer all of the IRS's questions. Now, they're very um, understaffed right now. So it's a long and painful process if you do get audited. Most of the audits right now are called paper audits. They send you letters. You fax or email, well, actually, they don't take email. You fax or overnight their, your, the information they're requesting and you send it to them. Then you wait a good hot six, six to 12 months for them to open that mail because that's how far behind they are. And you're getting interest and penalties along the way. So my goal in working with my clients is that I try to get everything as perfect as possible so that it doesn't get audited, so we don't go through the nightmare that it is dealing with the IRS when you get audited, because they're just not processing the paperwork in a timely fashion. They're over 24 million tax returns behind at the end of last year. That's just for last year, and there are another, I think it was like 30 or 40 million documents that has still not been opened for things like 941s, 1099s, W-2s, letters to the IRS, um, they are not answering their phones. They're answering their phones less than 10% of the time that people call them. So 
that's why I say make it make everything as clean and as pristine as possible, because now is not the time to, to test the IRS. They're 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 not in a very good mood. <laughs> they're um, they're retiring in legions, and the people that they're hiring can barely fog a mirror. I don't want to put my financial um, situation in the hands of people that got um, trained 12 minutes ago, because that's kind of what we're dealing with. They just hired eight, was it 8,000 agents, 4,000 agents, and they hope that they can have, they can train them in the next three months enough that they can answer the phone come February. <laughs> yes, uh -huh, that's the face I make too. Uh-huh. Um, so, so I have a practical question, like yeah. if, if, um, I mean, it's, it sounds like the general wisdom would be if you're starting out as an, as a real estate agent, forming an LLC in general makes a lot of sense, like separate yeah, your business and, and personal, um, finances, the S corp election, I guess. I mean, without knowing everyone's particular situation, it, is there sort of a a general rule of thumb? Like, would you want to see someone in business for three to five years before you make that election? Or I don't really look at it as how many years have you been doing it. Of course, the longer you've been doing it, the more track record I can see. It is a deeply personal position and decision to make. Um, so when clients come to me, so say you came to me, um, Kristen, with your information, I'm going to look at your p and I'm going to look at your income and expenses. We're going to talk about your life goals. So we're going to say, okay, is this a part-time job? Is it a full-time job? Is this, are you going to retire in three years? Or this, is this something you're going to do for 20 more? There's so many questions to ask to try to drill down. Is now the right time to be an escort? You don't have to make the decision today. You get to make the decision the between January 1 and March the 15th every single year. So if last year was a good year, and so you're thinking about, well, do I need to be an escort for 2023? Well, how much do money do you think you're going to make? 23 may not look like 22 at all. I mean, I don't know about you, but a lot of the agents I know are not as busy this time of year as they were last year. So then we're having to hedge our bets. Okay, is do we think we're going to at least make 60? So maybe last year you made 150. This year you make 60. Okay, you're still making enough. And yeah, okay, you know, you're planning to be in business for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Okay, it makes sense. Or it could be someone comes to me and says, you know, I'm working full time, but my, my kids are going to need a lot more of my attention right now, or I'm having another baby or whatever it is. It's going on in your personal life. My parents are aging. I'm only going to be able to work 20 hours a week. Whatever it is, we're going to have to run your number specifically and say, okay, yes, this makes sense to do it or no, it doesn't. Because it's it's not an easy decision to, to stop and undo. It's an easy decision to start mm -hmm. to file the paperwork. Um, so like I said, it's a deeply, deeply personal decision. But yeah. once you do... All of your obligations as an S corporation still sit there. So it's separate tax return and have to run payroll. Um, so, and like I said, I'm my philosophy is, is I'm not going to recommend an S corp unless I think I can save you more money than I'm going to charge you for doing the accounting work. Otherwise, it'll just keep you a Schedule C and keep your world as simple as possible. Um, but then, but like I said, the number, probably the number two, one and two mistakes people make is not separating their income and expenses, personal and business. And number two is picking the wrong legal entity, either not forming an LLC or forming an LLC and an S corp too early or forming an S corp too late. Um, and that's like I said, where, where we sit down and we have a discussion. It may only be a 15 minute, 20 minute phone conversation, but I can get and sit down and look at your personal numbers, where your personal life is in terms of your, your workload and where you feel the market is going. I mean, y'all have your um, thumb on, on your particular market. If you're newer in it, you know, you may take a bigger hit than someone that might have 20 years experience because each one of you have to have a different um, network of, um, of homes to sell and, and clients to buy. Um, so again, like I said, that's, 
that's the big picture difference between LLC and S Corp, but we'll have to drive it down to um, what your personal, what's personally best for you. Now, I do need to stress, because I see this mistake a lot, is people will form their own LLC. They'll do it with legal Zoom. Please don't. Please don't. Um, or they file the paperwork themselves and say, I'll just make up an example. I'll use my husband and myself. So, you know, say my husband's sitting there filling out some paperwork for it and he doesn't ask me anything. Um, and he says, well, I want my wife to be involved in the business. So if I die, she gets to inherit it. That's great. He just formed a partnership. He just formed a, a partnership that requires a separate tax return. And, um, and I love him and that's very sweet of him, but I may not want to file a separate tax return for me and my husband for the money that he makes as a real estate agent. I want him to be an LLC, which is going to be an easy Schedule C that's on our personal tax return. Now, where it gets really ugly and really um, very sad is when I have new clients that come to me, let's say March 27th. They show up and I pull their paperwork. Oh, good job. You formed an LLC. Fabulous. Let me print that paperwork. Okay, give me your EIN number. Super duper. And it's March 27th. Guess when their tax return was due? March 15th. They're already late. So now we've got a failure to file penalty we're going to be dealing with. It is extremely expensive because you're going to pay a per month, per partner, penalty for every month the tax return is not filed. So be very, very careful about how many names and how many people you form a business relationship with. Um, so if you're the only person that does real estate, you, you don't have to add your spouse. Um, it's not necessary. Um, you can set it up. I've talked to a bunch of tax attorneys and, and estate and will attorneys, any businesses that are started under the um, the umbrella of the marriage is, is essentially jointly owned. You might have to jump through a few more you know, hoops to, if I died and I need to give stuff to my husband, you know, he might have some more paperwork to do, but legally I, I don't have to put him on there. So uh, again, that's a deeply personal question to sort through with your personal uh, attorney. Um, and when you look at your wills and things of that nature, but I just need people to realize that if you have one spouse, like in my case, my husband that's in real estate, I don't need my name on his LLC because then I have to do another tax returns about that thick instead of filling out an extra three pages on our personal return. Um, so there's that. Um, what Alicia, other can you expand yeah. really quickly about the March 15 date versus yes. the April 15 date? So a personal tax return, as most people know, is due April 15th, unless April 15th falls on the weekend. And if that's the case, it's the Monday following the weekend date. So I think, I think it's the 16th or 17th this year. The all other tax returns that are business tax returns um, for LLCs, which are, uh, that are partnerships and, L and LLCs that are being taxed as S-Corps, those are due March 15th. Um, almost nobody does a C corporation anymore. Those are due April 15th. There's no tax advantage of doing that because um, those entities get taxed twice at the corporate level and the personal level. So if, say, I'll just make a, a, a like, if someone was my client, you need to make sure that I have your tax ID number and your business information, your LLC formation paperwork before March 15th, because I need to file an extension for you so that we, um, we don't get penalized with the failure to file. And that will give us breathing room and then we can still finish up the return. Uh, it's almost impossible unless you have an extremely simple return to get all corporate returns done by March 15th because you're not going to get your 1099s until February. You have to get all of your bank accounts reconciled. I have to find all the bits and pieces uh, for you, for your business that's missing, and you need to track all that down. And there's just literally not enough hours and enough days between February 1 and March 15th for everybody to get everything to all their accounts and everything get filed. So you're not going to get in trouble for filing extension. You're going to get in trouble for not filing extension. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is that 
you will get in trouble for not paying your taxes. What does that mean? So say you have a job working at Target. You get a W-2. You show up for work. They withhold taxes. They send them to the government for you. They send them to North Carolina, Social Security, and the IRS. Awesome. So at the end of the year, you take your W-2 and your, any of your other documents, and you file a tax return. No biggie. It's very different when you're self-employed because now you're receiving instead of a W-2, a 1099. So say you got a $15,000 commission check from um, EXP for selling a house. Awesome. You got to have in your mind that that $15,000 is not all yours. So you got bills to pay for your business. You got to pay those. But after that, what's left, you're going to have to pay the IRS federal taxes, which most people are, are usually in the 22% bracket. You've got to pay the state of North Carolina. That's 5.25%. And you've got to pay Social Security and Medicare, and that's 15.3%. Now, that's a lot of money of that $15,000 that, that's really not yours now. So some people that plan ahead but don't know what to do with the money, they'll open a separate savings account. I think that's great. And you move all that extra money into your savings account, call it your tax account. Now, the tax account still needs to not sit there with all the money in it. You, you need to send that money to the state of North Carolina and the IRS on a quarterly basis. So those quarterly taxes are due. Um, the first one is due April 15th. The next one is due June 15th. The next one's due September the 15th. And the fourth one is due January 15th. So you've got five days before the last estimated tax payment needs to be due. Now, let's, let's make our math simple. Say you owe $20,000 in taxes at the end of the year. The IRS thinks you should have a crystal ball and know on April 15th that you're going to send them $5,000 each one of those quarters. Now, the reality is that you are self-employed. You don't know how many houses you're going to sell, but you got to kind of estimate. Um, and that's really hard for my brand new clients that are brand new at their business um, so sometimes what we'll do is we'll do what I call a mid-year check-in and I'll like, okay, give me an idea of how much money you've made, what your expenses are, and we'll put together a quick pro forma. But once you've done a full year of accounting with me, every tax return, I'm going to give you your tax return and I'm also going to give you estimated tax vouchers. You're going to get four little slips of paper that need to go to the IRS and four slips of paper that need to go to North Carolina. And I'm going to calculate for you a, an estimate of what we think you're going to and project out what you're going to owe for next year. So you're in this scenario, you're going to have four IRS statements that have $5,000 each on them. And you're going to have, say we made uh, enough that I think you need four statements to North Carolina for $1,000 each. You'll need to mail those with a payment and that voucher on that time schedule. So I'm gonna literally give you a voucher and tell you the date it's due, the address to mail it to. It's gonna have your name, your address, your social security, your spouse's social security, and the dollar amount on it. And all you have to do is write the check. Now, um, some of you are really super awesome, good with technology. You can make these payments online. Let me tell you how that can blow up sideways. So when you're mailing it in with a coupon that's been created from the tax software, the order of the name, spouse first, your name second, or vice versa, your name first, spouse's name second, and your social security, all the information that the person that's opening that envelope needs, um, and it will also tell you what tax year for them to open it, deposit your check, and apply it to the right year in the right quarter. Awesome. If you go online and do it, you have to be very careful that you pick the name and social security that appears first on your tax return. You have to make all those payments in that name and you have to make those payments and make sure it is applied to the right tax year. So if you go in there and you accidentally apply it to tax year 21 instead of 22, it's like they didn't get the money. If you go in there and put it under your name, which appears second on the tax return and your spouse's is first, the IRS, it just sits there in the vapors and they can't figure out how to apply it. 
Um, I like to test out new technology with, with different um, government entities so I can make all the mistakes for you and learn all the ropes for you. And I will give you my personal experience with the new brand new IRS portal. So the IRS has a brand new portal. It's it's halfway decent. You can go in there, you can pull transcripts, you can look at your taxes for prior years, you can see what your payments have been, et cetera. Well, I have been married since 1995. I have had my social security number for 55 years. You would think the IRS would know that by now. They do not. So the new IRS portal that when you go in, I can't sign in by anybody other than me. So I, it's, a, it's using an ID me platform. So I go in, I have to take a selfie, have to upload my driver's license. It matches all the systems. And I go in there and I go, okay, I'm ready to pay my taxes or, my, or estimate taxes. So I can go in there and I can make the payments pretty as you please. Get to the end of the year. We file our tax returns. I owe a little bit of money and go in there and I pay, make the payments. I'm good to go. Four months later, I get a letter that I still owe the money that I paid four months ago. Well, how's that possible? So I go into my portal. Yep, there's the payment for the exact amount that the IRS has written me a letter. It took me five phone calls to five different IRS agents and a letter with all this documented mailed to the IRS. It is still not resolved because the IRS took my payment and applied it to my social security number. It didn't ask what my spouse's was. It, it just took the payment and it's holding it there in the ether. And even though it's exact dollar amount, and even though five IRS agents can see that I made the payment, not one of them can figure out how to move it from my social security number to my husband's. Great. So here we are in January. I am still trying to resolve it. I'm saying that because I have made three payments online. I just found out that they're doing it this way. Now, the old school system, I knew that they did it on my husband's, everything had to be on my husband's social security number because his name first, his social security number is first. He's considered the primary taxpayer. My name is second, my social second. So no problem, all my other estimated tax payments, I'd send the coupon in, send a check in, easy peasy. But I use the new system and it won't let me impersonate my husband, right? Because I have to take a selfie, I have to send my driver's license. So when I go in there, it doesn't ask me what how I filed, it doesn't ask me the balance due, it just shows my name. Okay, great, and I'll send money. And so I can see on my payments that it's sitting there, but we are still waiting. The last phone call we made, we made the fifth one, the agent said, I see you sent a letter in. I said, because mm -hmm, I couldn't get y'all on the phone. And she said, well, we're processing it. So they sent me a letter asking for 60 more days. Now we're at four months in, they're asking for 60 more days to literally take a payment I made four months ago and moving it and applying against the tax chart. So I, I test all these new systems, the IRS is out there on us. So if there's a problem, it happens to me and I try to you know share it with everybody I see no in touch um, in any capacity regarding these matters. So if you're someone who likes to pay online, we now know that, that we need to pay it online with whoever's name is the first on the list. Um, you'll need to have that spouse create the IDME account and sign in. Once it's set up, as long as you're sitting together and it can text, because it's going to text the phone of the person it belongs to, you know, anybody can make the payment. But to get into it each time, it's, it's going to require a text to the cell phone associated with that IDME account. And you'll need that if your kids go to college too. So it's it's a helpful thing to have set up. But those are that's probably some of my biggest challenges is trying to get the IRS to respond, answer the phone, read their mail, uh, answer and respond to letters that we send, um, process tax returns. Like I said, there are over 24 million tax returns behind right now. So um, 
everything that we can do to make it as foolproof in dealing with the government agencies, the better. Now, North Carolina, I can clear those problems up. I've got some best friends that work in the state of North Carolina. They actually return my phone calls and I can fax them, send them, email them. I can, I can do all the things with them. But until the IRS hires enough agents to deal with the deficit of capacity, you know, we're, we're going to be in this, this issue, this situation for a while. Well, Alicia, I, I, uh, we're kind of running out of time here. Yep. We have about uh, four more minutes. Okay. Are there any really pressing questions? I know Beth put one in about the different versions of QuickBooks online because some of them gets pricey. Oh, yes. Thank you. That's very important. So I don't care which one you buy. Just don't buy the self-employed one. It's useless. I, I'd rather you do an Excel spreadsheet and save yourself the money. Um, QuickBooks online self-employed do not purchase all others let me look it up real quick for you so I think sorry, it's can you repeat Star. that which one do not purchase do not purchase um quickbooks online self-employed it's so watered down i'd rather you just put it on an excel spreadsheet um it doesn't create the reports it does you can't reconcile accounts um, it's, it's basically a useless product. It's a waste of money. Now the ones, here we go. Pretty sure I have that one too. Simple starts the one you want. Say it one more time. I'm sorry. Simple. Simple start. start. Mm -hmm. It's, um, right now you can get 50% off at three months for $15 a month. And then, uh, it's 30 after that. Okay. You have been incredibly helpful, Alicia. We greatly appreciate it. Like I said, Absolutely. I'll be um, um, put this in the group. If you want a checklist, let me give you a quick email before we get shut down. Um, I do have a checklist of common expenses to track. Just send an email requesting it uh, to my front office. Um, that email address is office, O-F-F-I-C-E, at ciskmorriscpa.com. And that's S I S K M O R R I S C P A dot com. I just send them a note, say you were in my class and that you want the checklist, and, and uh, my front office staff will send it to you. Yep, that's it. All right. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll go ahead and make sure that this is accessible to everybody else in the group and encourage them because obviously, a ton of good information. Good. Glad it, glad it was helpful. And Reach out to the office if we can be a further assistance to you.